so first of all thank you for having us here uh, it's a great pleasure uh, i'm michael khadjanastasis and i'm a first phd student at the Cold polytechnique uh, this is a joint work with uh, johannes uh, george Zasoulas, and uh, my professor uh, michael vazirianis uh, yeah johannes if you want to also introduce yourself so. Hey everyone, I'm a postdoc in the same group as Mikhail, working on graph neural networks. And uh, I think George might not be here yet, but maybe he'll try and join later. Yeah, great. So today we're going to present you our paper called Graph Ordering Attention Networks. Um, so first of all, let's start with uh, some desirable properties that uh, a GNN aggregator should have. And yeah, first of all, uh, it's the permutation uh, equivalent property. So here we want uh, our, our GNN to produce uh, the same output for different uh, representations of the same graph, essentially. Um, and the second one is the injectivity property. So many recent uh, works studied uh, this uh, property of GNNs. So what we want essentially is uh, that our GNN to produce a different representation for different uh, multi-sets of neighborhood nodes. So, or more generally to, to be able to discriminate between, for example, different uh, graph structures. And they also usually relate this to the WL algorithm. Uh, but in this work, we, we mainly going to focus on a third property that we call relational reasoning. And uh, but by this property, we, we mean the, the ability of a GNN to, to capture uh, multiple interactions between uh, the neighborhood nodes. And uh, if we assume uh, a general uh, message passing neural network framework, uh, and yeah, let's denote uh, the, the message from a neighborhood node V to a central node U as uh, CUV, then we can see that, uh, for example, for some very well known GNN models like uh, GCN and GIN, that uh, this message is, uh, is a function that takes us input. Uh, the, the hidden state of the neighborhood node V and the corresponding entry in the graph shift operator. So for, for a graph shift operator, you can imagine the adjacency symmetrics, for example, or the Laplace. But what is important here is to see that uh, this message uh, is only determined uh, by, by the hidden state of the neighborhood of the neighborhood node and uh, this value. And if we take a, a step further, and we can see that in graph attention networks, uh, this, this message from, from the neighborhood node V to the central node U uh, is also uh, a function of, of, the, of the representation of the central node. Because in order to compute uh, the attention score between these two nodes, you have to take into account uh, both node features, right? So um, we can see that in this case, uh, yeah, CUV is also affected uh, by the hidden state of the, of the central node. Uh, so in one sense, uh, GAT, uh, it seems that it's more powerful than the other two in this context of relational reasoning, but still uh, this message is not affected by the other neighbors. So it's, it's pretty hard for, for these GNN models to capture uh, these types of interactions between the, the nodes, because essentially the, the message of each node is, is, is only a function of this node and the central node. So, so essentially G, the GNNs treat uh, each node individually. And uh, in order oh, to... Wait. Yeah. Wait. Sure. What do you yeah. mean with treat each node individually, based on that? Yeah, uh, what I mean is that uh, essentially 
when we aggregate the messages from, from the neighbors, we, we just, uh, for example, apply a summation uh, after all, all the messages, but each, if each individual message is not affected by the other neighbors, right? Yeah. As, as, we, as we saw in these uh, models. Uh, yeah, actually in GAT you also take into account the central node, but still you don't take uh, into account the neighbors. So yeah, is, is it clear? Yeah, but isn't there some uh, theorem that we can model any permutation invariant? Okay, you yeah. you get to that, I suppose. Yeah, you, you, you're right on that, but um, what what we essentially in theory yes you can do it but as we will see in practice it's it's difficult to do this because you don't have this uh, inside your architecture so yeah in theory uh, you you may capture all of these interactions but it's it's a bit hard right yeah i mean it's pr pretty contrived how you would uh, for example, with the sum, um, do you have it somewhere here on the slides? So maybe people can talk about it easier just by chance. Uh, yeah. I, I don't have it, but... No, no okay. Yeah. yeah, it is pretty contrived how you can use the sum to uh, then come up to, for example, just do a max aggregation as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, also in this context, there are some works that uh, say that uh, you need an exponentially large uh, hidden space if you use this uh, sum summation operator to. So yeah, yeah in, in theory that's true. But uh, yeah. So the, what you're just... saying, in principle, we could model every permutation invariant aggregation function, but. Uh, does it happen in reality? No, probably not. So uh, yeah. let's try to improve it. Yeah. For example, also with an MLP, we can. In theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Clear. So, yeah. Le let's let's proceed. So, uh, so in our work, we we somehow uh, used uh, a framework for um, information theory in order to formalize a bit these type of interactions between the neighborhood nodes. So here, if we denote uh, the, the hidden states of the neighborhoods or the neighborhood nodes as uh, H of N U, uh, we, we can see that the mutual information between uh, the central node and the multiset of the neighborhood nodes can be decomposed uh, into three parts. And the first part is the unique information. When we denote this as U, the unique information of each neighborhood node, the redundant information, and we call this with uh, the R, and the synergistic information. So if you observe uh, this figure, uh, you can imagine uh, that we have this central node that it's our receiver and we have two center two two nodes that send messages uh, for, for clarity we have omitted the self edge here but you can also think that the central node also sends a message to himself but yeah so we can see that uh, here that the the redundant information is essentially the common information that we get from these two neighbors. Uh, the unique information is the information that we get uh, separately. And we have also this synergistic uh, part. And uh, if you think about this in the, in the graph context, we have an example here. For example, in the Cora data set, we can imagine that this uh, unique information corresponds, for example, to the unique keywords in the, in, in the nodes and the Redundant information corresponds to the to the common and to, to the repeatedly present keywords, and maybe the most important one is the synergistic part, where the where it corresponds to the combination 
of some keywords and essentially we say that uh, this synergistic part is only we are only able to capture it if we look uh, at multiple nodes together so so essentially what we want is uh, the the contribution or the message of of a neighborhood node v to a central node to the central node u to be a, a function of the whole neighborhood so essentially in our model we introduced this dependence uh, in contrast with uh, some other gnns uh, so here we can observe a bit the some details of our model so first of all in order to to introduce this dependence of 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 the messages of the nodes we, we use a recurrent neural network uh, so because in its in its step of of the recurrent neural network the 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 previous inputs uh, also affects affect the the output of the next one right so so that's a, that's a good way to introduce this dependence between the nodes but uh, it, it's well known that in the, in the graph context we don't have a specific ordering right of the nodes so um, if we want to use uh, this uh, recurrent neural network we have to first to specify uh, an ordering of the nodes and what we did is we used uh, an attention mechanism that implicitly also uh, gives us the ordering of the nodes so let's assume that we have this uh, neighborhood and we want to update the representation of the green node of the central node so what we do is we apply an attention mechanism uh, in order and, and then we, we extract these attention scores and we sort uh, the neighborhood based on these attention scores. Okay. So, up. so you, you just take H, uh, HI in this image, right? Take the dot product with HM, HK, HJ, and look what's the largest, the second largest, and the third largest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you also have these self heads. So, yeah, it's, it's like in, in graph attention networks, basically do a similar thing here uh, but but in this way you you also obtain uh, this ordering of the neighborhood right okay so it's not what i just said right uh, if you say it's like in graph attention networks you uh, concatenate the two things and then output a single number from an M mlp yes 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 uh, okay yes we, we use the attention mechanism of the graph attention network and then order by the inferred attention scores. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Uh, um, but, yeah, but you, as we will see later, we can also use some other attention mechanisms. For example, from the GADV2 paper or yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then we have our sequence. You run your LSTM on it, and you end up with a final um, embedding. Right, that's not yeah. up, Benny. And yeah. Then any other points here? Yeah, no. Then maybe to this question that we also had on Twitter, like yeah. you sort here according to the attention values, and then you run your LSTM on them, and right. sorting isn't differentiable. Uh, are yep. there any concerns arising with this or any yeah you you are you are right on that but yeah as, as we will see in the equations uh, we also use uh, this so so this is the equation that we yeah. use in order to yeah to obtain the attention scores but we we also use um, this uh, w1 uh, in order to transform uh, the hidden states, right? Uh, so even if uh, this sorting operation is not differentiable, you, you will have your gradients uh, in these two vectors. In, yeah, in this mm -hmm. matrix, in this vector. 
So you, essentially, you can't train this whole thing. OK, but why would it give you the correct sorting, so to say, then? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So we make an assumption here that uh, the, the, that the attention scores are somehow correlated with uh, a good ordering of the neighborhood. And uh, as we will see also in our experiments, uh, the ordering uh, matters for the final performance. So even, even in graphs where you, you don't have a natural ordering, uh, there are some specific orderings of the neighborhoods that will give you a better performance. And, and we uh, experimentally, we saw that uh, if you just use this, for example, simple heuristic by, by taking the attention scores, you can obtain uh, very good orderings in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but we're not tr training these matrices to produce the right ordering, but we're so to say still training the matrices to pay the right attention to um, to something. Exactly. Yeah, but but also you have to think that uh, you you essentially you don't have labels for the ordering, right? Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. But maybe there is some right ordering for this sort of aggregation mechanism that the network could learn and uh, teach the, uh, now I'm speaking in very human terms, teach these matrices to produce this ordering, but we're not doing that. And um, maybe that would be even more helpful. Yeah. True. We, we, here we assume that the ordering by magnitude of attention scores is a good ordering. Yeah, fine. Yeah, Be because you also want to keep uh, the complexity low, right? So yeah, that's a, that's, that's a simple approach that works. Yeah. <clears throat> and then on the next slide, you were showing or oh, there's a question in the chat maybe ah yes thanks do you maybe want to read it out sure sure uh, someone is asking doesn't traditional gnn model get messages from its neighbors um, each neighbor does message passing to the central node so what is the motivation behind making each single message passing aggregate all the neighbor information so i think what they're asking is the uh, What's the what's the motivation of making the contributions of neighboring nodes depend on all other neighboring nodes? And I suppose our our answer would be that uh, as we showed in slide one, if the message of each node depends only on this node and the central node, then it's extremely optimistic to hope that you capture synergistic information. I mean, if you want to capture interactions among neighboring nodes, uh, this is far easier. If the message from neighboring nodes uh, is dependent on all the neighboring nodes. Uh, so, so this is our motivation. We, we, we thought on graphs, we're likely to have a lot of redundant information, a lot of synergistic information. And in order to have hope of capturing this, we need to observe neighborhoods uh, in their entirety. This is yeah. almost like a try, trying to get triangle updates, so to say, right? Um, where we, like if we have triangle updates, then we always look at taking triplet, like two of our neighbors and taking all of their features into our information of how we update our current node now. But now, like doing this for every possible triplet also wouldn't really be possible. And yeah, now with your sorting thingy and then running an LSTM on it, um, you're sort of getting maybe more, uh, more out of this, yeah, more yeah. neighborhood infection. But yeah, Rio G, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. I think I just wanted to clarify the question. I think the confusion I had was because um, 
I think when in the first slide when you when you clarified on the how like existing traditional um, graph neural networks architecture is limiting is because it only gets messages from the hidden state HV. Um, but here we say that the graph shift operator is, for example, like in DCN, is the is a adjacent matrix, adjacency matrix or an attention uh, for graph attention network. But I think here we we're kind of ignoring the fact that we can have uh, we can have weights for these single like message passing. So that like I think the assumption that graph convolution networks and graph attention networks makes is that we can make it more expressive by having individual weights. So I'm just kind of confused, like why does it need to have a separate kind of like an entire neighbor aggregated information when you can kind of um, make each message passing more expressive by having different weights, which can also like be learned by the aggregated information from all its different neighbors. I I think our, our, what we're saying is firstly, it doesn't need to see it all. Like our model has an advantage if, if our data set contains redundant and synergistic information. If somehow every node contains unique information of unique relevance to the central node, then uh, we expect the traditional GNNs to work perfectly well. But if for our learning tasks on a graph, interactions of neighboring nodes are relevant, then the traditional models cannot capture those. And uh, our formulation can. Isn't it right, Michalis? Yeah, I, I want to ask uh, in which weight uh, do, do you refer exactly? Do you refer to the attention weight in your question? No, not just the attention weights, but for example, like graph convolution is not just purely like, it's not just that they only multiply with the adjacent, adjacent, adjacency matrix, right? Like there's specific weights that that captures like both in the message passing stage and the um, neighborhood aggregation stage of graph neural networks. So if we have weights on these two different settings, why can't the model like existing models learn uh, like neighborhood like interaction with these like weights that are used in like aggregations and message passing? Uh, well, um, I'm not sure I, I... Okay, so maybe I don't get the, the question completely as much as Johannes or Michael, but um, so we could learn everything here, right? And we, we also have interactions between the neighbors. We have interactions from one neighbor to the other neighbor with, with two message passing steps, for, yeah. for example, and then re-aggregating this stuff. But, well, maybe this is just a little easier for the network to learn if we have this form of interaction between the neighbor information. Then if we have uh, this more complicated form of uh, information sharing between the neighbors where we maybe, for example, do two message passes. Uh, Anyone know where that's coming from, or should I mute some people? Uh, whoop. Yeah, let me mute this guy. And... Yeah, yeah. I, I think Hannes, you are completely right on that. You you can't have this type of information with if you stack many layers. But yeah, in this case, we want to make it more explicitly inside the architecture, and even yeah. with one. But, I mean... I think that's clear to everyone. And if uh, um, Ryoji, you mean something different, then please let us know in the chat as well. Uh, but let's maybe have one more question by Francesco. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the presentation and the work. Uh, do you have an intuition why ordering matters in aggregation uh, neighbors? Uh, uh, or, uh, well, features. it matters because we run an LSTM on it afterwards. No, no, but this is what, this is the how it's done. But why? So the intuition on the why is relevant to process uh, uh, information in an ordered way. No, so I mean, we know LSTM 
suffers you know, from ordering, suffer from you know forgetting uh, past things. So why should this matter in aggregation in aggregating neighbors know? So what I would have said is just that we only uh, impose an ordering on this because we then want to process it with an LSTM. But yeah, Michael or Johannes. Yeah. yeah, essentially, if you if you put a random ordering uh, in this in in the LSTM, you 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 will lose the permutation uh, invariant property in your neighborhood. Right, because then you will have a, a random ordering, so you will have a different output yeah. of your LSTM. So, so. But the, why why do you think that ordering the node is uh, important? I mean, I understand yeah. you want to, let's say, if you process the same node a different time, you want to have the same sequence. You don't want to uh, yeah. permute it. But, but why do to... you think that the ordering? I mean, yeah. the, the sequencing is important. To add to, to this question, like, do you have a concrete example where ordering the nodes in that specific way is beneficial? Yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good point. And we, we, we have uh, some experiments later that what we, we, we do is we keep the ordering fixed uh, throughout the, the training. So, so essentially, you just uh, have the LSTM with fixed ordering. And we experimentally saw that uh, our model performs better than that. But, but uh, there, there is also some uh, previous work that uh, like try to, to explore this aspect. Uh, but essentially what they say is that it's probably due to some uh, optimization and training dynamics that there are some specific ordering orderings that lead to better performance so theoretically yet we don't have a clear answer on that i think and i think there is no one in the literature as far as i know but uh, there are some experimental works and also in our paper uh, that uh, show that yeah that's all that so experimentally we, works but you don't you're not sure why i i think i think it's related to training dynamics i think there's i mean theoretically the lstm is the universal approximator so we should be fine with any ordering but i think empirically we're starting to see that there's certain ordering for which it's easier to learn an optimal set of weights of the lstm and so essentially by learning a reasonable ordering by attention weights first we're making the task of getting optimal LSTM parameters easier, and in that way are able to fit a high-performing model in practice. So I, I, my understanding is that while the ordering should not matter in theory, in practice it does because of training dynamics. And also I think it's related to the phenomenon that we, we essentially we share the LSTM across the neighborhoods. So somehow if you, if you, order uh, all these neighborhoods based on some criteria like the attention scores you somehow process uh, uh, all the neighborhoods in, in a more you know in a more common way and i think it it may also be related with that and uh, yeah uh, one other thing is that uh, you, you can have some tasks that uh, the, the ordering is, is important itself in the task and we designed uh, yeah actually in, for, for example uh, if you want to find the maximum of in a list if you have a sorted sequence then it's pretty easy right so if if your tasks if your task somehow demands uh, somehow it becomes easier if you sort if you apply a sorting operation then uh, this can be helpful, right? Good question. Thank you. And then we also have a very important question in the chat. I think that I uh, that I also had. Uh, do we have permutation invariance here? It does not seem straightforward to me. 
Yeah, we, we will check the proof later. We okay. do have essentially because of the attention scores and the, the way that they are computed. Because Good. also in GAT. Yeah. Yeah, let's just get to that later with the proof. And then okay. John, can you make it very yeah, good? Let's not like your question about um, interactions. If we're saying we want to learn more about the interactions of the neighbors, uh, linear or nonlinear interactions. Well, uh, here we're enabling nonlinear interactions with our LSTM of uh, sorted stuff. All righty, let's go. Okay. So, yeah, essentially we can see that uh, we, we don't capture all the different interactions because you, we will need all the different permutations here, but we capture a large amount because, for example, from, for, the, uh, for the representation of the, of the last node, you take into account uh, all the previous ones. So you can have multiple interactions inside that. And also in our experiments, we, we use a bi-directional LSTM. So you, you have both directions and that's, that's more powerful. Yeah. Also, you say, right, that um, on Twitter, you wrote that GraphSage with LSTM aggregators, like they've just take a random ordering and Oh, sorry. Let's get to that later when you come to the permutation invariant stuff. Let's yeah. go, go on in the slides. Okay. So yeah, um, in the, in the last equation, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's proceed. So yeah, also we can see that uh, these oper the generally if if the attention scores uh, are not equal with each other, these uh, this operation is deterministic. Uh, but in case where we have the same attention score for two nodes, we have somehow to solve this tie because we want uh, this operation to be deterministic and to have the same output each time. So that, that's a small detail because it's pretty unlikely. To but you the, the... can't do that, right? Like if you have symmetries in the graph, then you will not always end up with the same prediction, even though you would want to always end up end up with the same prediction. Uh, what What do you mean? Now consider um, consider an, a graph which is just a six ring. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and now the attention that you be paying to your two neighbors mm. is same and the your two neighbors are identical yeah. uh, but you how do you sort them now yeah if they are identical we we don't care essentially because because the output of the lsm will be the same because you will have for example two blue nodes here right so um, why will the output of the LSTM be the same if our ordering is different? If, if the two nodes have uh, the same hidden states, if they have the same features, for example, if you have two blue nodes, then it doesn't matter who you put. Yeah, first. okay. If, you, if we're only talking about two, then let's say we have a third neighbor as well. And uh, now you have to your first your second and your third embedding and let's say the second and the third are the two ones that are the same and um yeah right the embeddings are the same so we yeah. will end up with the same prediction yeah. from our LSTM. okay yeah. makes sense so so the the only problem is when you have uh, the same attention score but different hidden states so you have the, the problem will be here if if you had uh, the same attention score between the blue node and uh, these uh, purple nodes, right? B because they have different hidden states. But so so in this case, we what we do is is we is we sort them by the by the hidden by by the hidden states. 
So we just uh, put the smallest uh, first, for example. It, it just, you know, a heuristic. Yeah, it's to... clear. You just take the hidden state, do something to it, and end up with uh, another yeah. short space. Yeah. yeah. But in practice, this shouldn't happen, though, because uh, the attention weight is a float floating point number. So. Yeah. Um, exactly. What do you. But if we have symmetry. Well, if the node features are, are, are different. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, clear. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So for the for the sequence modeling part, uh, you can use essentially uh, whatever recurrent neural network you want, uh, like a GRU or an RNN. But mostly we observe that uh, the LSTM is a better choice because we somehow also relate this to the um, information theory framework that we presented. That's now, what do you mean with you somehow also related? Yeah. Like, yeah. Do you I have that... some actual concrete relations or? um like now some some ideas of why it might be nice or intuitions why it might be nice yeah basically these three bullets are oh, like, okay uh, oh good yeah. so that's our explanation and uh, the reason for why using an lstm might make sense but yeah, yeah can we also just say um we've seen that LSTM fixed some problems of RNNs, so LSTM stay work pretty well here. And that's what we see. Yeah. All right, then let's continue. So first of all, uh, using it for get gate uh, allows us to discard uh, the redundant information. And uh, so uh, as we process the neighbor, Michael, these yeah. points hold for LSTMs in, in general, right? And I think we can skip. Yeah. Um, okay. To slide six. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's why we, we, we explained that why it's better to use an LSTM than, for example, yeah. an RNN. Okay. Um, yeah, so in the next part, we can we can uh, use also a multi head attention. So, similarly to the GAT or GAT V2, uh, for example, we can in this way we can have several orderings that we take mm -hmm. into account in our model, and this uh, usually leads to a more robust. Uh, how many frame. heads do you usually have uh, usually we have eight uh, okay. generally we, we we try to fix uh, uh, this between the models or between that and our model so yeah usually we we use uh, six or eight 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 heads um, yeah so the equations that we saw before uh, they are transformed uh, like this. So now we have k heads. So we have k vectors for transforming the hidden states. And in the end, you have also k LSTM models, right? So yeah. in order now, now to have the final uh, representation, you can concatenate the, um, the output of the k LSTM models, or you can sum here. So do you... Uh, uh, um... Yeah, let's go to the next slide. But uh, do you have any um, experiments looking at if we have graphs with larger sizes, then the number of attention heads that we use, uh, the, uh, if we have graphs with a larger average degree, then the increasing the number of attention heads helps less because right the number of permutations grows um factorially and the number of yeah if you just then increase the number of attention heads you cover a much smaller space of the number of possible uh permutations yeah the, that's a good point 
we don't specifically examine this in our experiments, okay. but Good. yeah, that's promising. Uh, yeah, so based on what you asked before, we have uh, a, a proof of the equivalence of our model. So uh, yeah, the proof is pretty simple because you can observe that uh, that using the, the, the attention scores from the GAT model, you, you will have uh, essentially the, the same sequence every time, right? So, so the whole model will be uh, permutation equivalent because essentially we use uh, this ordering that's produced from the GAT. Uh, yeah, and the second one, we we have a result of uh, injectivity of GOAT. And essentially, we make use of theorem three from Hammer, where establishes a, a similar uh, approximation theorem from NLPs into the recall neural networks. So, so generally, the idea here is that uh, we can approximate uh, an injective function arbitrarily well uh, in probability uh, due to the use of uh, the LSTM. Mm, uh, can, can we, can you do the, the permutation equivalence for me again? Yeah. Okay, so, so what we want is to have a permutation invariant operation for, for the neighborhood. Yes. Right? So uh, let's assume that uh, we change, we have a different permutation for, for this graph, right? Uh, you, you can, and so what we want is uh, to produce the same output. Right. Yes. Uh, but using the self-attention mechanism, uh, our this, attention values yes. will be different, and then yeah. our sorting uh, will be different. Or like our sorting will be the same. Um. Or like. <laughs> yeah. I. I yeah. Get it. Because. You see, the, the the values will be the same, right? Yeah, but they they will be assigned to different uh, the 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 ones that have the features. The features will still be ordered the same way. Let's say it like that. Yeah. The, the point is that uh, our our goat layer acts on each node in a permutation invariant way. So if we permute the labels of the graph, uh, yeah. the output of this the first ordering by attention and then the LSTM will not change. So on each node, we act uh, in a permutation invariant way. And so yeah. this allows the whole layer to interact with the graph in a permutation equivariant way because permuting uh, the input nodes and applying an invariant function locally I will- think Everybody got it. No one was as slow as me on this. <laughs> no, no, maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's confusing. All right, let's yeah, yeah. go. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, yeah, now let's uh, go to the experimental section. So, first of all, we designed some synthetic data sets uh, in order to show uh, how this uh, synergistic information is crucial. So in, in the first uh, synthetic experiment, we call this top two pooling. We sample some random graphs with one dimensional node features. Uh, and we assign the, the label of each node to be a function phi of, of the two, uh, two hop neighbors that have uh, the largest uh, features. So in order to capture this, essentially you have to consider two tableau relations because you want to find the, the two largest features, right? 
So, so you have to do some comparisons essentially between the, the, the features of the node. And uh, yeah, that, that's why synergistic information is important for this task. And uh, we also designed two more synthetic tasks uh, that, uh, that uh, have this uh, synergistic information, but in, in a structural uh, way. So essentially we want to predict some uh, structural properties of the node. And uh, the first one is the between centrality of a node. And the second one is the effective size of a node. So yeah, um, essentially the between centrality is given of a node U is given from this uh, formula. So you, you have to compute uh, the number of shortest paths uh, that pass through this node U from all, all other nodes. Um, and for the effective size, uh, you have to count. Uh, so in the ego network, the effective size of any ego network. So you have to count the number of edges between your neighbors. Uh, and then uh, you also have to count the number of nodes in the ego network. So essentially, if, if your neighbors have many edges between them, your effective size is small. Um, yeah, so both of these metrics are affected by, in this case, the structural interactions. So the edges between uh, the neighborhood nodes. So yeah, and here we, we have some results on that. So uh, we have uh, two, two types of, uh, graphs in, in, in the first case we have 100 mm -hmm. nodes in the second case we have 1000 nodes this is the probability of uh, the edge creation with uh, Erdo Reni graphs um, and we compare with some uh, well-known uh, GNN models uh, yeah and, and in the in the structural tasks we measure the mean square error and in the in the first one, uh, we measure accuracy because we transform this into uh, a classification problem. Uh, yeah, to better check the results, we we have this plot, so we can ah. see that. Yeah, I mean the other results showed also showed the error path, right? So yeah, step maybe it, more useful. It, Okay, if you prefer this one, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You're right. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, what did you want to say? Yeah, we observed that, um, uh, yeah, GAT uh, has uh, trouble to solve this task. Uh, actually, it was hard to converge them. Uh, and um, yeah, so in theory, whether we can explain graph stage at this Yeah, I think that's a good question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Essentially, I think the the only difference with graph stage mean is the aggregator. So they 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 use a random ordering of the of the nodes and they aggregate them using uh, an LSTM. But isn't that uh, problematic? Like, um, how do yeah. you determine this random ordering? Yeah. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. determine it at all, right? So it is, yeah. it's not permutation invariance. Am I missing? Yeah, something? exactly. No, no, you are, you are completely right. Yeah, it's not. But, but no, wait. yeah. Like, Johannes. The, the random ordering is is fine, isn't it? It's permutation invariant. The output should not should not depend no. on the input ordering of an R and and in theory at least, right? Um, the output of an R and N does not depend on the input ordering of the R and N. Oh no, it should. Sorry, <laughs> are you right? Well, it's um, the the problem here is not the permutation invariant uh, of the the graph, but like of the 
random ordering itself, uh, I would guess that if you use a random ordering, you would um, train with different random orderings uh, d during inf inference so that like in the end, it learns a form of invariance to permutation and not that it's embedded in the architecture. Uh, but here, by no using way. the attention weight, it becomes the ordering becomes embedded into the architecture. Yeah, but that's the the whole thing, right? If we we can either learn, let the network learn, that it should produce the same results um, for all of these different orderings, which are factorially many, um, or we can build it into the network. Yeah. If well, we don't uh, build it into the network, yeah. then we should have a pretty huge problem. No. I guess this is why they, they they present the bot algorithm to avoid that problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I mean, I was just wondering if maybe I'm missing something about the graph sage LSTM thingy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then. And there's oh, a follow up what? question. So, the difference between GraphSage, LSTM, and GOAT is the attention for selecting the sequence. That's the yeah, price. Uh, actually. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go on. You go ahead. You can. Uh, yeah, actually, we also use the attention scores to multiply the hidden states. So, so we use the attention scores to find the ordering and to uh, transform the hidden states so and we have multiple heads that's another difference that we have with our graph stage yeah so we have multiple random orderings so to say well just that in our case they're actually not random yeah okay. yeah in graph stage you have one yeah in um, okay. That's now cool. the next question is whether graph stage subsamples the k values in the neighborhood or uses the entire neighborhood. Um, what did we do in the experiment, Nicholas, for graph stage? Did we subsample the neighbors? Yeah, no. yeah. I use the default values from uh, from the DGL uh, library, so. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what's the k value for for their implementation. But yeah. Um, okay, but your okay. implementation public, so so yeah, it can be checked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Thanks. So. In theory, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah. uh, so yeah, in theory, we we can see that uh, an LSTM can easily uh, identify and uh, these two relevant nodes uh, using a low-dimensional hidden space for for the top two pooling uh, experiment, because for example, we can process each node and when we find uh, uh, a larger uh, hidden uh, a larger feature we can store this uh, node right so so it's 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 pretty easy for an LSTM to solve this problem but in contrast uh, using other GNNs uh, you will need an, a very large hidden dimension in order to capture all of the, all of this information Right, uh, be, because uh, as we design this, uh, as we de design this experiment, uh, many nodes, many neighborhood nodes, don't affect your label because you only care about the the two that have the largest feature. So yeah. Uh, yep, that's essentially the same results, but different visualization yeah can we go uh, to the real results or the yeah, yeah those uh, no, those not the, the real the real results the real world data set results 
the other results are also interesting maybe even more interesting than than this yeah yeah so so we have uh, these well-known data sets um and in this case we also use the different uh, recurrent neural networks so so we observe the performance using a gru and then R uh, extra yeah in some cases also gru for example performs better uh, than the lstm so yeah even in theory lstm it may may be better but yeah uh, and uh, yeah we, we can see that in this data set actually graph sets with uh, the random ordering performs better than us but yeah in all other cases we we had performance uh, well yeah well, you um you never really outperform the other models right in any of these uh, tasks um let me see which model do you, in which model do you refer uh like cora for example okay no no for cora i don't have any error bars but for the disease thing, for example, we are uh, not doing significantly better than the graph sage LSTM. Or for computers, we're also not doing significantly better than the graph sage uh, LSTM. And yeah. for photo, we're also not doing significantly better than graph sage LSTM. But I mean, uh, don't don't let me don't let me be rude here. Like I just want to say, we're this is a cool cool thing, right? And we can see on the synthetic data sets that you made that you're doing um, that this is better for some tasks. Uh, maybe we would even be. Um, do you think? this is better for data sets with a high node degree or a low average node degree yeah like, that's that's a good point and actually we 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 have a case study later that that we see that our model is better where, where neighborhoods are really dense so in this case we we extracted some neighborhoods from the amazon data set and we saw that uh, GAT and GIN models uh, failed to classify correct these three nodes, and uh, but we correctly classified them, and uh, we observed that these graphs are pretty dense, right? Um, so the, this this somehow aligns with uh, yeah our advantage of capturing this synergistic part because of that. Uh, yeah. No, no. So, Can you explain it again to me? Like, why are explicitly these examples interesting? Like, because they uh, have some symmetry, or because, for example, these two are complete graphs. So, so you have uh, many edges, right, between the neighbors. And uh, as we saw before, uh, like uh, GAT and G GIN cannot handle these uh, type of interactions, right? Now, how did you select these examples? Yeah, we just uh, randomly. So uh, you took all you took all um, predictions that were misclassified by GAT and Jin, but correctly classified by GOAT, and then you yeah. took, randomly to, to, took these three and that's what we find. Yeah, the, the, there are also, you know, other, uh, there are some other neighborhoods that. Uh, yeah, but uh, did, did you choose these three randomly over all neighborhoods that were correctly classified by GOAT and misclassified by GAT and GIN? We also uh, checked for some uh, patterns. Um, okay, uh, like, but, but like, what should this case study tell me? 
that if we have a densely connected neighborhood, then um, guts, uh, then goat performs good, right? Yeah. And so, the, but the if you now select, um, specifically select for a densely connected neighborhood, or did you randomly select them? Yeah. You, these these three cases were specifically selected, but uh, but th this pattern generally existed in the predictions. So so yeah, th these three are, are not random. No, yeah. th these three are hunted. I think a good uh, thing to to add to the study is, for example, like uh, other cases where goat failed but got and gene succeeded. Yeah. Um, and also like with different random initialization, do you always find the, do, do you find an overlap between what was correctly classified by GOAT versus badly classified by GAT and GIN? Because, um, you know, when you randomly initialize your network, uh, performance changes by a few percent point, And maybe what you're observing here is just like this uh, randomness in the test set, right? Um, so it would be good to have a comparison of like, uh, samples where both GOAT and GAT work, samples where uh, GOAT worked, GAT failed, and samples, samples where GAT worked and GOAT failed. You really see like what, what's the pattern here. Um, and also having statistics, for example, uh, have a correlation between like accuracy and a node degree to see what's uh, the degree or uh, accuracy versus um, node degree divided by total graph connectivity to have an idea of the density of that specific node. Uh, and uh, be because here, like you say that it works better for dense nodes, you provide three examples. Uh, but if you nitpick something in the data set, you can easily find counter examples with, with the same density. So having proper plots of like accuracy against density and accuracy against degree uh, would would help in your case. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, uh, I agree. Thank you. But uh, yeah, to continue on this argument, like, uh, and this is something that Francesco asked at the beginning as well, like, why do we need to order the nodes? Like, what does it provide us that a simple attention uh, that a simple GAT or GAT v2 does not provide us. Like, what kind of extra information um, does the ordering and applying the LSTM give the model compared to like just the uh, yeah. aggregation? Uh, essentially, you you capture the interaction due to the LSTM because its message then it's a, is a function of all the previous ones, and you need the ordering in order to apply this LSTM. But also there are some orderings that produce a better performance for the LSTM. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know if it's clear, but the, the, the interactions are captured due to these recurrent neural networks. So the, the, the ordering uh, doesn't affect somehow the interactions, but we need this ordering first of all because we need these permutation invariants in our model sure and i, I understand i understand that yeah. part the question yeah. is like is there what's the benefit of treating your neighbors as a sequence instead of tra treating them as a set like most of the graph neural network they treat the neighbors as a set and yes. they aggregate the set using a sum a mean a um, yeah. or an attention weight but here, instead of treating your neighbors as a set, you treat your neighbor as a sequence. Why, because, why is that beneficial? Yeah, because you, you can't apply the recurrent neural network in a set, right? Well, I think, I think basically what we spotted is in the gut, um, the contribution of a node depends only on that node and the central node. So when you aggregate uh, your neighborhood information in that way, then you cannot capture these kind of triangle or, or high order interactions among neighbors. 
because they are functionally not included in your aggregation scheme, right? They, right. So, they, so, so you have to transform somehow the set into the sequence in order to to add these dependencies. So that's that's the benefit. Uh, Right. In so case. in that in that specific case, all the nodes get to interact with each other before the aggregation, uh, whether with GAT or with uh, GIN, yeah. for example, they would be squeezed together like like the, the they they would be squeezed together independently of each other, and like yeah. the one that has the biggest value wins. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the Sorry, Mikan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go so on. You... Yeah, this is the point that in standard GNNs, it's, it's neighbors are processed individually. And, and for us, giving them an ordering allows us to process them jointly. Right, makes sense. Um, so this is why you say that, like, with higher degrees and higher density, applying your method. Uh, allows like the because the, the higher the degree, the more complexity there is in your neighborhood, and your method will allow to process this complexity better. Yeah. When, uh, yeah. Okay. This makes uh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would really love to see like really comparison between like increasingly like in, increasing the node degree and saying. Uh, that your model works better with graphs with higher degrees or like just on the test set splitting like the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ju just having the test set being uh, plotted on a plot on average degree of the graph or a, a node degree and for node classification I think this would be very interesting and would help like demonstrate this thesis of yours that you can better process complex neighborhoods yeah the, yes, yeah, that's a very good point because actually in these experiments, uh, the average degree, uh, yeah, pretty much the same. It's very close, but yeah, that that, that makes sense to to explore different uh, densities. Uh, yep. Good. So we have uh, three questions in the chat now. Uh, Remy oh. asked, "What is the disease data set?" So the disease data set uh, is from the paper from Ines Shami from 2013. It's an SIR data set that Mikhail has found. Ah, and Menan asked, what's the computational time versus the traditional model? Mikhail, can you talk a bit about that? Yep. Yeah, uh, essentially, you have uh, uh, the, the complexity of, of the gap to produce the attention scores. And then you also have a, a complexity of uh, the LSTM. Um, so yeah, actually in, in our implementation, we, we, have a, we have a tensor here that has size a number of nodes times a maximum uh, node degree times node features uh, uh, because we apply padding in, in the LSTM in order to process uh, all the nodes um, together. So this is yeah. a slower method than GAT or GCN, but... Yeah, but it's pretty comparable, right? Yeah, not much though, I suppose. And considering the fact that we take into account higher order interactions, it's fairly cheap because we only consider one ordering and not uh, several like other methods might. Mm, yes, there's another question, the longer one by Rebecca again. Could this have to do with the washing out effect that happens when you aggregate over too large over diverse neighborhoods? And then in brackets, this could explain why graph stage is so close in performance since the other approaches are taking in the entire neighborhood, but I think the GLs, GS, sub, uh, graph stage subsamples. Um, 
I'm not sure what uh, you refer to by this. Could this have to do with the washing out effect? Mm. Yeah, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I'm also not familiar with this concept. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't get it either, but Actually, so yeah. that, that's this was related uh, to different densities. I maybe she's making the point that uh, on very high degree, very high degree nodes receive a lot of messages, and so after aggregation, it's even tougher to identify interaction mm. Mm. because we mm. aggregate. Uh, yeah, th this is true. Yeah. I guess we might yeah. be seeing that high degree nodes. Uh, we do especially well for high degree nodes because we uh, don't aggregate before we hope to capture interactions. Rather, we capture interactions uh, while observing the neighborhood. Yeah, this makes sense. And then a final question, uh, since we have a sequence, why not try along the lines of node to record deep walk? I mean, those are unsupervised methods. So um, we might as well benefit from the fact that we have labels and, and train a supervised method on, on the sequence. But other than that, it's a sensible suggestion, I think, right? Um, yeah, uh, let's present our final uh, experiment. So in this in this case, we we, we in, in the blue in the blue plot, you can see the the the, the, the model that we presented before, and uh, and what we did is that we stored the different orderings throughout the training. And then we trained the model using a fixed ordering uh, obtained by the 20th epoch, and this corresponds to the green line, and to the 620th uh, epoch from the initial model. And uh, yeah, um, we can see that uh, a fixed ordering, the uh, has a lower performance if, if, you, if you obtain this ordering from the initial epochs. But if you obtain the ordering from the final epochs, we can see uh, that, the, that the performance is better. So this indicates that our model uh, learns somehow some meaningful orderings of the nodes and that these orderings produce better performance. Uh, yeah. It's worth saying that this experiment is in direct reaction to the comment of Professor Niepert that we got last night on Twitter, where he asked what happens if you fix the ordering. Uh, Michalis found out if you fix the ordering, you get slightly worse performance. Yeah, I think that's that's very, uh, very cool. Um, so I have a, um, yeah, sorry, Hannes. Like, I have a if, question here. Like, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. If you now, uh, so you always run this on the test set, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I think we can say that the, the fixed one is a little worse. You haven't tried to use the ordering of the ST, LSTM for the GRU or RNN, I suppose, to see if there is an absolute order. I don't get it. What do you mean? So this ordering is is computed using LSTM. So and is the ordering of neighbor nodes for each node. Uh, so my question is, if this order is absolute, so it's independent on the method or depends on the method. So if the order learned with LSTM also works well with uh, uh, GRU or uh -huh. RNN, 
or the other way around? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. The, these are linked only using an LSTM. Yeah, but maybe you want I... to to check for other recurrent neural networks. Would it like why would it be different? Yeah, okay, but I mean, uh, running more experiments never hurt. So th the point is that if the order is dependent on the method, that it means that the ordering and the method are connected. No, so then mm. this ordering is not related to the structure of the graph. It's more about the learning yeah. mechanism. Yeah, but okay. If it but is could... independent, uh, it's then it. It means is related to the structure of the graph yeah. and the feature of it. So an, a nicer experiment that I would be more curious in is if we just uh, use a different if yeah if we just use different seeds, do you always end up with the same ordering or not? And yeah, yeah anyway. Yeah. I see the it would be now. really interesting to Thanks. see the, like uh, the correlation between the ordering and yeah, the C that you use. Right. Yeah, it, I I see the point now. Yep. Next um, slide. Ah, oh, no, Tom. Yeah. So one of the the main purpose here of like what you're doing with the LSTM is that you say that way, like all the nodes get to interact with each other before. All the neighbors get to interact with each other before being aggregated. Um, and to do that, you need a specific node ordering. Uh, yeah. But uh, wouldn't there be like uh, um, another way, like without node ordering, to just use a deep set on the entire neighbor at each aggregation step? Or to use, for example, uh, a transformer, uh, like on all the neighbors like instead of having got attend only between the receiving node and the the sending node like just to have every all of the nodes con connected to each other as well as connected to the receiving node so that way like uh there's no need to have an uh ordering and to to use uh, something like an lstm that cannot be parallelized too well and you have like all the connectivity so is there a reasonable choice between using this ordering um, and LSTM instead of another way of dealing with uh, many neighbors. I think with a deep set, you will have the same problem. I mean, I, I didn't get how you will obtain these interactions using a deep set. Yeah. But yeah, so using. For the second part, the, yeah, probably using a transformer can make sense. I, I guess the deep set, deep set also can approximate any injective function. So yeah, I think that's a reasonable idea. Like, like that, that should work. That's, that's a nice idea. Yeah, essentially GIN uh, somehow uses deep sets, right? So. Again, you will have uh, the summation of individual parts. So that's what you want to avoid here. Yeah, I guess we're trying to make the point that for our architecture, it's, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to capture interaction effects. But we're not saying that no one else has a chance at this uh, or that this is the only possible approach. But mm -hmm. our architecture is motivated uh, to make it uh, somehow as easy as possible to learn a set of weights which uh, which capture these interactions. But it's, I think it's a good idea to to, to also try deep sets. Uh. For, for deep sets, I'm, I'm not, I mean. Yeah, but I, I, I think it in it. some sense, uh, no, I think in some sense uh, you write here like uh, what the standard GNN does is like using this kind of uh, set function. Uh, yep. So, yeah, this directly compares to them. Okay, sorry for the interruption. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah, the, to sum up a bit, uh, we, we introduced this uh, parcel information decomposition framework to the graph context where we decompose the information into the synergistic part, the redundant part, and the unique part. Um, yeah, we, we proposed uh, graph ordering attention networks 
which uses a permutation sensitive aggregator, but also uh, still has the permutation uh, equivalence property due to the ordering part. Uh, we saw in the experiments that the ordering matters. And uh, yeah, we demonstrate uh, a good performance in synthetic and real world tasks. You can f uh, find our paper in archive and our, our code in GitHub. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention.